Whatever I need to say because he tells Timothy, look, in the last days, a time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they'll accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myth. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Where he goes, Timothy, there's going to be a time when no one puts up with this but you. As for you, let them go. They're going to go and, and, and they're going to just find a teacher to tell them what they want to hear. Why? Because they're a lover of pleasure. If they want to get divorced, they'll find someone with a PhD to tell them it's okay to divorce. If they want to have sex outside of marriage, they'll find someone with a PhD to explain to them, oh no, no, this is okay. If they want to be greedy and spend all the money on themselves and neglect this mission to reach the unreached around the world, they'll find someone with a PhD to explain to them why it's okay for us to just sit and bask in all of his blessings. We'll just find someone to tell us whatever we want to hear. You want to abort your child? You want to marry someone of the same sex? I'll, I'll, I'll find you a teacher. Christian, PhD. I'll tell you it's fine. You want to stop believing in hell? I'll find you someone. The PhD will tell you that. You want to just believe that there's no punishment, that God's a God of love and only love and there's no wrath? There's no judgment to come? There's plenty of books about that. What, what do you want to believe? What's your pleasure? What, what would you like? I'll find you a teacher to give you that. But Paul tells Timothy, don't you be one of those guys. You know what this book says. You preach it. You lay it out there. Now is the time to stay the course. Now this time is to stay strong because the time's coming. People are going to be lovers of themselves, lovers of pleasure, not lovers of God. That was an audio clip from Francis Chan talking about the last days. Um, just kind of the attitude of the culture of the last days. And uh, man, that's a... That's a verse that we've talked a lot about on this show as well because it's just so, you know, the, the verse that he's talking about, uh, I believe out of the book of Timothy, it's just the letters to Timothy, uh, the, yeah, Pauline letters to Timothy, is that it's just so spot on. It's so spot on with our culture today. And uh, you can listen to the whole thing. Uh, you can just go to the web, my website, scriptureandprophecy.com. Um, I've started uh, introducing, reintroducing, I should say, an area on the website where I add in videos on a, almost a daily basis of things that I think uh, you might find interesting. So make sure you're visiting scriptureandprophecy.com. You'll find uh, find those videos, and that's one of them that's up there. Uh, greetings, and uh, happy Thanksgiving. It's Thursday, November 23rd, 2017. Thanksgiving Day. Psalm 9, verse 1 and 2 say, I will praise thee. O Yahovah, with my whole heart, I will show forth all thy marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoice in thee. I will sing praise to thy name, O thou most high. You know, if you've got food in your stomach and a roof over your head in the world that we live in today, then you've just got so much to be thankful for. And most of all, if you have had your eyes open and have known the good news that Jesus came and was crucified and rose again from the dead, paying the price for your sins, then you have so much, so much to be thankful for. And uh, I'm certainly thankful for all those things. And I'm also very thankful for all of you, you know, for giving me a reason and an outlet to talk about the scriptures. I'm thankful for all your patience and prayers and support and for putting up with me and my ever-changing formats and views and for walking with me and, uh, you know, as I try and follow the Savior. Uh, and I thank you for making this possible. And by making it possible, I simply mean thank you for showing up and actually listening and, uh, and then praying for me and my family and putting up with me and my rants and being willing to support me and my family in many other ways. And so, you know, I'm very, very thankful for that. And, uh, you know, last year, at exactly this time, 
uh, I felt like God was speaking to me about some things and speaking to me about the King James Bible and about getting back to the basics and the pillars of our faith and about being grounded in truth and not falling for fables and doctrines of men. And as I look back over the year, you know, I started out pretty good and I fell into some old traps here and there. Um, I really took the bait on the Great American Eclipse thing as one example. Uh, but on the flip side, I didn't fall for the Revelation 12 sign stuff that was being propagated that so many false prophets were talking about. And sadly, they're still talking about. Uh, you know, I released a podcast on Thanksgiving last year talking about how I wanted to get back to all those things. And so, you know, and, and spend more time just doing Bible studies and going over the scriptures. And I think I spent like 20 minutes talking about the King James Bible and the serious problems with modern translations like the NIV, just as one example. Um, and then that's when I went on to create uh, scriptureandprophecy.com. Uh, which used to be truthfed.com. And uh, so I'm going to attach that podcast episode to the end of this one, by the way. Uh, I think it's going to bless you to listen to it again or for the first time if you're new. Uh, so this will be you know, a much longer podcast than normal, so it'll go right in from what I'm talking about right now and into the podcast uh, from last year. So... Let me get a drink of water there. So now we are here a year later. And uh, I feel like God has been dealing with me yet again. It's probably not a coincidence because I've been praying diligently for wisdom and understanding about Him and about His Word and His Son Jesus and the current times we're living in because there's just so much deception and so much confusion and so many opinions and... You know, we've lost really, you know, we've lost the old path as to say, you know, you know that's what I was talking about last week about getting, getting, reading the church fathers, reading ancient well-renowned uh, uh, commentators like Matthew Henry. And, and so I've been diving in to all of that, trying to relearn what did the early church believe? What did the early church say? What did the apostles of the apostles say, you know, trying to trying to get back to those foundations of the Christian faith. And needless to say, just like last year, uh, he's turning my world upside down and showing me some things, some hard things, some challenging things, especially as it relates to end-time prophecy. And hopefully sometime in the near future, I'll be able to start sharing and showing you uh, what I believe is being shown to me. Uh, but I need to gather a lot more information, do a lot more studying and praying and all that before I start sharing some of these findings. But I suspect we'll be doing a new series about the last days at the beginning of the year. And I think you're going to find it very eye-opening and convicting, yet also challenging. And you're also going to discover that it's not a new thing. It's just new to this generation. So be looking forward to that. And, um, you know, I want to do a great job with it, which is why I want to take my time studying it and putting it together and uh, you know really fasten it down and make sure I have a have a an accurate perspective and so yesterday uh, or a couple of days ago I don't know I was I was listening to last year's podcast I guess it was Monday I was listening to last year's podcast and I feel like I like I said you know looking back over the year I feel like I started out doing really well and doing exactly what I had planned but then kind of went back to some of the old ways in regards to the podcast and and how I was presenting information you know the King James Bible etc so today what I all I want to do is just kind of renew some of those thoughts rant a little bit if you'll tolerate it and like I said I'm going to play that podcast again for you guys and just add it to the end of this episode. Some of you may be new and you've not heard the information about the King James Bible. I've got several videos on this topic. Uh, but the podcast was more than just about it. It was also about focusing on Jesus and about moving back to the basics. And so last week I recorded what I guess you would call it part 1 of this series of returning to Messiah, remembering your first love, focusing on Him. 
You know, sadly, people, and, and even myself at times, get caught up. And we get so caught up in our pet doctrines, and with them we become so religious and so blind and forget to actually have a relationship with Christ, with Messiah. People get so caught up in these sacred names and the end time prophecy and the dream, this dream over here and that dream over there and some this this blood moon here and and this man made prophecy over here because this guy had a dream or thinks he sees something in the stars. And of course, I'm also talking about myself and my own shortcomings. You know, everything I'm ranting about, I'm also guilty of at some point. And you know, I'm sorry, and I re- and I repent of those of, of that when I when when I get off track or when when I do that. You know, and I'm personally looking in the mirror, taking a look in the mirror, and I suggest that you do the same thing and ask yourself, and be honest with yourself: Do I really love Jesus? Do I really? Do I love God with my whole heart, mind, and soul? Do I? This is what we should be asking ourselves. Do I really love my neighbor as myself? I mean, when it really comes down to it. Or do I just love myself? Is myself and what I want and my comforts and my pleasures what really comes first? Am I one of those people that the scriptures talk about? That I am always learning but never able to come to the full knowledge of the truth? Am I a lover of pleasure more than a lover of God? What does your life say? Because your works, you know, regardless of what you say about how you feel, and what you think, and your perspective, what what does your life say? Because your works and your fruits will provide the truth, not your lips. What would your spouse say if they were ha- if they had to answer truthfully? What would your kids say? What about your coworkers, the people that I interact with you on a daily basis? You know, and, and again, I'm asking myself this same question, and I'm suggesting that you ask yourself the same question. You know, it's really hard for me right now to talk about end times or anything else for that matter when what I see online in the chat rooms, in the comment sections, not, on, not just on my videos, but on other people's videos, on other Christians' videos, and on, on different things, and different channels. What I see in those areas, and what I see in church buildings, sadly what I see is a bunch of people who just really don't even know Christ. So, what good is it to realize, to understand that He is coming back soon, if you don't actually know Him? I mean, what good is it if you can read and say five Hebrew words if you don't have a relationship with the one who created all the languages of the world? You know, and since I and while I'm on that subject, I'm going to rant about it a little bit. You know, sometimes, and this is the truth, sometimes, not always, but sometimes I regret ever teaching or expounding on the Hebrew text and the Hebrew language and the heritage stuff. I do. Sometimes I just really wish I'd never got, never touched it. And here's why. It's not because I don't think it has value or use or benefits, because I think it most definitely does. The reason why sometimes I have regret about it is because you have a whole movement of people out there fighting over how to pronounce names, how to pronounce the Father's name, how to pronounce the Messiah's name, on and on. And the hilarious thing, about it all. The most ironic thing about the whole thing is that a majority of the fighting, 99% of the fighting, is amongst a bunch of people who don't even know Hebrew. I find it astounding that English-speaking people are arguing with each other over how to talk in Hebrew. It just it blows my mind. You have English-speaking people condemning others for speaking English. It's, it's absolutely absurd. And, and not only that, but they're demanding that you use the Hebrew names when they themselves don't speak Hebrew. They didn't grow up in the culture. They couldn't order a sandwich through a drive through if they were in Israel right now, unless they spoke it in English, because English is spoken quite frequently over there. Yet, they condemn people for speaking English. They think they know something. 
They're wise in their own eyes. The scriptures say if a man thinks he knows anything, he knows nothing yet that he ought to know. So many people are always learning, but never able to come to the full knowledge of the truth as the scriptures have foretold, full of pride, full of arrogance. You know, and what I've noticed after studying Hebrew, both biblical and modern, for several, several years now, so it's not like I just got into this, been looking at it for a long time, what I've learned, what I've noticed, is that most of the YouTubers online using sacred names and teaching their own Bible translations, at the end of the day, they don't actually have a clue how to read or pronounce it. That's what I've learned. As I've learned more, I've realized they don't even know what they're talking about. And I'm dead serious about this. I've witnessed it so many times. There are a lot of people out there doing this. And I regret to say that for a couple of years, at least for a year, I was, you know, doing the same thing. I was one of them. And listen, here's the thing. There are some who are literally using and creating their own Bible translations. And this is not a joke. They'll even tell you, I'm not using any Bible translation. This is my own rendition. They're using their own translations, meaning they, they translate it themselves and expound on it themselves, and they're teaching Hebrew, yet they can't even read and write and speak the language. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? They know a few words, a few phrases. Some of them do know the Aleph Bet. Some of them know the Paleo, paleo or Pictorial Aleph Bet, meaning they know the alphabet. But that's generally the end of their knowledge. They've not been immersed in the language. They couldn't have a conversation in the language. They couldn't pick up the Bible, read a chapter in Hebrew, and then tell you exactly what it says. Yet somehow, they are qualified to create their own versions of tra and translations of the Bible and teach the language. And this deeper meaning. I'm, I'm just amazed at all this, just astounded. You know, if for nothing else, I'm glad I studied the subject because before when I was really ignorant and was just following some of these people blindly because they used fancy Hebrew words and I thought they must, well, they must be really be wise. Oh, wow. They must have some deep, uh, secret, hitting understanding of the scriptures. Oh, man, it's been translated in English. I couldn't understand it as good as they can. Oh, man, English is pagan and evil. I mean, I used to think that before I started diligently studying the language for myself. And after... Uh, you know, after a couple of years of that, I was saddened to discover that most of these people I was following are simply frauds. Or if they're not frauds, because I think many of them actually do love the Lord, I think they're just kidding and deceiving themselves. Along with everybody else who's following them. This is why, you know, and this is why when I realize I'm wrong about something, or I change my mind about something, I share it with all of you. And I just kind of have to just accept that I was wrong. And I, and I don't try to save space or save face, so to speak. You know, when I screw up or when I'm wrong, I say, hey, you know, I was wrong about this. Because I have to answer to Messiah one day. And I want to at least be able to say, you know what? I taught and I shared what I actually believe to be true. Instead of worrying about saving face and protecting my reputation. You know, I hear these people using words, using these Hebrew words, that, and they're not even pronouncing them correctly in any Hebrew dialect. And then their followers come to the comments and use the so-called sacred names and use them incorrectly. All while condemning people for daring to use English, it just drives me insane. I mean, listen, my friends, for a thousand years people have been getting saved in the English name of Jesus. I realize that that's an English rendition of his name. I'm not stupid. I realize that. Demons have been cast out in the name of Jesus. People have been healed in the name of Jesus. Great, massive, powerful revivals have happened in the name of Jesus. People have literally been resurrected in the name of Jesus. Yes, the English version, Jesus. You do not have to say Yeshua. 
You can if you want. It's not wrong to say Yeshua. That's the Hebrew version of his name. But you don't have to. Or Yahushua or Yahshua. There's about five variations out there that these people are fighting over. And just and just for people's own information, there's just so you know, there's many Hebrew dialects out there, my friends. Many. Many different scripts too. You know, and over the past few years I've taken a handful of Bible courses. I've read a lot of books on the subject, and here's what I've learned. Every single one of the books and every single one of the courses and teachers teach you to pronounce many of the words in different ways. I'm dead serious. Every one of them. The way you will pronounce and understand certain words will greatly depend on what teacher you're learning from. If you're going to learn Hebrew, then learn it from a fluid, natural speaker who grew up speaking the language. Not some dude on YouTube who's never been outside the U.S. who just happens to have a cool Hebraic-looking beard. I mean, come on, guys. And look, I'm not down on you. I've been, I've been in that place. It's just I get a little irritated by what I see online, and, and I just don't want all of you falling for this garbage. If you're going to learn the language, that's great. It can be very helpful. It can be very beneficial to your Bible studies. But learn it from somebody who actually grew up speaking the language, who actually knows the language front and back. I mean, let's be wise. Let's walk in the true spirit of God and in truth. And if you don't know the language, then don't be condemning and you know critiquing other people about what word they use. When you yourself couldn't speak a sentence of it. Be careful about how wise you think you might be. Just because you know a handful of Hebrew words. I'm saying that as someone who's invested a lot of time, money, years, energy, and sweat into studying it. And I see people getting really puffed up about it when they think they know. And about what they think they know. And that's not the manner or the attitude of Messiah. Messiah. Messiah is humble, and so are his followers. So I bring all this up because personally I'm just sick of it all. Just to be open and honest with you, I mean, listen, brothers and sisters in faith, I don't regret studying Hebrew. It's very useful. It's very nice for looking deeper into certain words and whatnot. It can be very useful for teachings. And the truth be told, I absolutely love looking at it and studying it. I just have a great passion for it. What I'm saying is I do regret, at times, using sacred names, sacred name Bibles, and being part of the whole Hebrew Roots movement, as it's typically called. That I truly do regret. For all the reasons I just shared with you. And, you know, for a year I read out of a sacred name Bible. And, you know, I regret that too. And, you know... and he, and here's what, and it's not like you know, it's not like I had impure motives, you know. I just wanted to know more. And you know that since I'm on the topic of the sacred names, I'm just going to share some things with you guys because I don't want you to be deceived. You know, the complaint and the reason that people go to sacred names, one of them is, and there's several different sacred name Bibles. The one that we've typically talked about on this show is the Hallelujah Scriptures. There's also one called the Scriptures, 1998, and you know, there's several of them out there. The complaint is that all the other Bibles remove the Father's name, right? They insert the word Lord. And I understand that, and I find that strange and disturbing as well. I'm not sure what that's all about. You know, the Jews, long before the Christians were doing that, the Jews started doing that, replaced his name with Hashem. Or they would just they would just add the name Adonai. They would just say Adonai when they came to the yod heh So it wasn't like the Christians invented this thing. It was kind of inherited. Um, but what I want you to know is, you know, the complaint is, oh, well, the Father's name's been removed. Well, did you know that every single sacred names Bible, that at least that I've ever seen, um, and I've read many of them, they also add the Father's name in places where it's not. Yes, sir, they sure do. In countless places, in the Hebrew text, the word Adonai is used which means Lord or Master. 
which should actually be translated as Lord or Master. But in your sacred name Bible, you'll find yod heh vav -Hey, where it should say Lord or Adonai. Adding the Father's name where it shouldn't be. And you know what that shows me? And I've, I've kind of discovered this after searching through these Bibles and coming across this time and time again, is that what these translators did... See, you guys... And I don't mean you guys. I just mean in general. The general thought is that some really awesome Hebrew scholars came and put these together. What they actually did is they took the English text and translated it back into Hebrew. They didn't go pull... You know, you can go research where they got their studies. And it looked like Holy Scriptures as an example. You can go and they show you what resources they used to create their translation they, they're not the manuscripts. They, they used other Bibles, English Bibles. And so you're even further removed from the actual manuscript because the New Testament, as an example, goes from Greek to English into Hebrew. So you've got three, like three translations there. And then the Hebrew goes from Hebrew into English, and then they take the English and try to change it back with, and add Hebrew names. Do you see, do you see what I'm saying? It's, you're even further removed and what they've done, and this is why you see yod heh vav -Hey in places where it's not even in the text, is because what these so-called translators did is they used a search and replace program. And everywhere the English word Lord was, even uh, the lowercase Lord, they inserted yod heh vav -Hey. You know, at least the King James Bible and even the art scroll Jewish Tanakh make it possible for you to distinguish between the two. You open your King James Bible, Lord, lowercase, lowercase letters, means Adonai, or Master. Lord, all caps, L-O-R-D, all caps, means that's where the Father's name is. They at least make it possible for you to know. You're not going to know when you have a um, sacred names Bible because they insert it where it's not even supposed to be. And if you don't believe me, go look for yourself. Listen, use the sword with the strongs alongside a sacred name version and see what you discover. I'll give you one easy example that you can go look up yourself. Go to Genesis chapter 18, verse 3. What we have in Genesis chapter 18, verse 3 is Abraham. And he said, this is the scripture, verse 3, chapter 18. And said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away. Pray thee from thy servant. He said, My Lord. In the King James, it's L-O-R-D, lower caps. If you look up the word, it's H136. In the Hebrew manuscripts, what it says is Aleph, Dalet, Nun, Yod, Adonai. Adonai. He said, my Adonai, my Lord, my Master. He didn't say, my yod heh vav -Hey. He said, my Adonai. Now go look in your sacred name Bible. You'll find the word yod heh vav -Hey. Put in God's name where it ought not to be according to the Hebrew manuscripts. I mean, isn't it just as bad to insert words as it is to take words away? I mean, it's still adding and taking away. This is just one example of a list of problems, and I'll let you do your own research on that because what I do know is that people love their pet doctrines and their pet things, and it doesn't matter what information I show. People are going to defend it. So you can do your own research if you're so inclined. You know, those Bibles are great for vocabulary. If you're learning Hebrew, no doubt about it. Great for the vocabulary, but they're not great for doctrine or verse memorization. And that's why I no longer read from them and haven't for a very long time. And that's why I don't even recommend them as a primary Bible. You know, again, I think something like the Hallelujah Scriptures can be handy for learning Hebrew vocabulary, but it shouldn't be your primary translation for doctrine and understanding. You know, at the very least, you need to use it in parallel with your King James Bible. Anyway, I need to end the rant. It's I'm running out of time. You know, so wrapping all this up, you know, like I said in last week's podcast, it's great to study and understand the perspectives of the language of the Old Testament and to understand the feast days and what they represented and why they were celebrated. But we must not stray or forget that we are now in Messiah. As the scriptures say, those things were a foreshadow of things to come. They pointed to him. The scriptures clearly say there is no longer Jew or Gentile, friends. 
That's what the scriptures tell us. There's no longer Jew or Gentile. All who are in Messiah are the seed of Abraham. We are all Israel if we be in Messiah. You do not have to live in the modern state of Israel. You do not have to speak Hebrew. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus who walk according to the Spirit, not according to the flesh. And some of these things that people are trying to do and observe are in the flesh. And they're calling it Spirit, but it's not. You know, and I I have no problem expounding on Hebrew and teaching those perspectives, but if the only reason that you're here, the only reason that you're listening the only reason that you support the podcast is to hear Hebraic perspectives then and so-called sacred names, and you've probably you're probably not going to enjoy this podcast moving forward because I'm just just like I committed last year and fell short, I'm committing again on focusing on the scriptures and looking to Messiah who died for us all and brought us into a better covenant, as the scriptures say. Sean doesn't say that. The scriptures say that. And I'm no longer going to sit around worrying about using English words and you know, for crying out loud, I speak English. Let me let me do one more rant while I'm at it, since I'm on a roll here. Let me just say this. People need to stop saying Ruach HaKodesh in their sentences. If you're going to say it, just say Ruach Kodesh, not Ruach HaKodesh. The Hebrew word Ha means the. So when you say HaKodesh, that means the holy. If you say ha Mashiach, that means the Messiah. So when you say in a sentence the Ruach ha Kodesh, you're saying the word the twice. <laughs> and it's another thing that the sacred name Bibles do, which is why we have this problem. And I'll at least give credit to the chronological gospels, they print it correctly. And you know, when they add it into the sentence it just says Ruach Kodesh. But when you're saying you know, what you're actually saying is the Spirit, the Holy. And I'm sorry, that, that just drives me bonkers. If you said the whole sentence in Hebrew, then it would make sense. But if you're going to mix English and Hebrew together in the same sentence, then let's at least do it right. Say the Ruach Kodesh, not the Ruach HaKodesh, because that sentence you just made, because you mixed, decided you, want, you, needed the, you decided that you had to mix English and Hebrew together, so now you're saying the Ruach, the Holy. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> oh man, I, look, I realize people are going to get really fired up and upset about this, and that's fine. You know, some people are going to pull their funding, some people are going to unsubscribe, and that's fine. Because at the end of the day, I just want truth. I just want the truth. And hopefully some of you are being blessed, and hopefully, hopefully some of you still love the name Jesus. You know, I'm going to load up that teaching from last Thanksgiving for you. And, and, and just to be clear, you know, we're going to continue to do our gospel portion every week. And we're going to continue to do our Torah reading every week, just like normal. And we're going to continue to have this podcast. And we're going to continue to talk about prophecy and some of the crazy news out there that I haven't had a chance to get to. But there's some wacky stuff going on. We're going to continue to look at the extra biblical books. We're going to still have an occasional guest, which I haven't done in a while, but I'm planning on doing. All of that just like normal. Lord willing, that is. The point today is I just wanted to reiterate my ultimate goal, which is to call people back to righteousness. Because I do think there's this lukewarm, greasy grace junk going on in the church today. And I think that's why so many of us are attracted to the law, because we're just we're sick of wishy-washy, lukewarm Christians. But we cannot forget that we rest in the finished work of Christ and Him alone. So let's stop being divided. Let's stop allowing division. Let's just be one in Messiah. Here's my thoughts from last year. hope that it blesses you, and I hope that this message blessed you. Peace and grace be with all of you. Have, a, have amazing Thanksgiving. Remember all the things you had to be thankful for. God bless.
All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Psalms 12, 6 through 7. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Psalm 119, 89. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word? With my whole heart have I sought thee. O oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Psalm 119, 9 through 11. I will worship toward the holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name greetings happy thanksgiving and welcome back to truth fed i'm sean and the website is www.truthfed.com and uh, we're talking about the Word today. And I just gave you a handful of promises uh, from God that He will preserve His Word, that His Word will be magnified above His name. Those are some pretty serious promises. You know, God has promised to preserve His Word. He commands us to study it, to write it in our hearts. He has promised that heaven and earth will not pass or will pass away, but his word will never pass away. Now, if this is true, then we must find out where his word has been preserved. And uh, I'll give you a hint. It's uh, most definitely not in your modern translations. Uh, you know, there's always been an attack on the written word of God, and it's especially violent today, which should be no surprise because we're moving into the last days. And of course, there's going to be a lot of deception. Uh, even now, there's so many psyops and deceptions taking place to get people to not trust the King James Bible. Have you noticed that? You've got the Mandela Effect stuff. You've, I mean, there's, there's endless attacks to get you to think, well, you can't trust that King James Bible. You know, there's a couple of lies out there that even myself that I am guilty of falling for at times. Uh, let me just list two for you. Here's the first one. This is the one that, that really got a hold of me. And it's a lie, my friends. And, and the lie says this. You can't understand God's word. It's not pure or preserved unless you know Hebrew and Greek. And, you know, I really fell for this lie hard. And let me tell you, my friends, I've spent a lot of time, a lot of money, learning Hebrew. Only to find out that I really didn't need to. Now, I don't regret it, and it sure is fun, and it is helpful. And I love to use it for teaching purposes and things like that. But it's certainly not necessary. So don't let anyone if you're listening out there, convince you that you can't understand what God is saying unless you learn Hebrew. That is false. And there's a lot of people out there who teach Hebrew, who teach Hebrew roots, who, um, even people that I follow, and uh, they're just wrong. I mean, they're not always wrong about what they're teaching as far as uh, some Hebraic understanding and things of that nature. That is certainly helpful. But they're wrong when they when they say you can't, you know, the English word, you know, the English versions of God word. It's all wrong. 
you can't really understand it unless you like me and you can understand Hebrew, is what they're saying. That's a lie. Lie number two. You can't understand the King James Bible. It's too hard because it's, it uses a handful, and I do mean a handful, of old English words, and you're just too dumb and stupid to understand it. That is a lie. My 10-year-old can read the King James Bible, and so can you. I mean, you really have to learn just a handful of words. So I want to make sure that you, that these two lies, that you understand that they're, that they, that's what they are, they're lies. Because I, I'm guessing that some of you out there have fell for these, because I fell for the Hebrew one. And while I think, again, that it's helpful, it's certainly helpful. It's helpful for teaching, it's helpful for understanding, it, it's, 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 a, it's a great thing to take on and try to learn. Uh, but as I've dug through the scriptures, I've found that uh, it was, definitely wasn't necessary. And, and, you know, that's only two of those lies. There's always been those, like I said, who try to corrupt and bend God's word. Even Paul, even Paul talked about this to the Corinthians. In Second Corinthians 2.17, he says, For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. Paul's saying many people are corrupting the word of God even right now. But as of sincerity, but as of God, the sight of God, speak we in Christ. Now a question that I get, that I've gotten often over the years, and it's probably because I've spent a lot of time reading out of the Hallelujah Scriptures, but a question I get a lot is, what Bible do you use? Uh, so this is not a strange question either, considering there are endless trans translations and opinions out there. Many translations have been released just in recent years, many. And you know what? It is my contention, that, and I believe that the sole purpose for a lot of these translations being rele uh, released is for the purpose of making money. And when selecting a translation, one must consider what are the views of those who translated the manuscripts, and what manuscripts did they use? Let me repeat that. When you're deciding on a translation, what Bible version should I use? You need to consider what are the views of the people who did the translation, and what manuscripts did they use? Of course, the church in America doesn't teach this at all. They don't inform their people about these things because they themselves are deceived. How many pastors are standing up in the pulpit using a apostate version of the Bible? Let me back up a minute. I've been feeling in my spirit lately um, that the Lord might be calling me back to teaching the basics, and I shared that with you guys a couple weeks ago. And, and by the basics, I mean just the pure word of God. So many people, myself included, have been guilty of being led down these crazy rabbit holes by YouTubers who know not the word of God. They use the things of men, the things of Antichrist to teach their message, such as luminary signs and cards and pyramids. and They, they jump on every single legend, every single thought, every single fable. Remember last year? When the world was going to end on September 23rd. You guys remember that? The world was going to end on September 23rd, right? Because all the movies, all the music, all the signs being propagated by the elite were stating as such. Remember all the movies that, that showed destruction and things and they said that date. September 23rd, 2015. Remember there was mountains of this information coming out. And it was pretty compelling. And I was even compelled to believe it. Because there was no shortage of signs in elite statements, movies, and things like that claiming this. Yet, here we are, over a year later. Let us not forget that our information must come from God's word and no one else. Especially when dealing with prophecy, end times, and future events. Only God knows what tomorrow will bring. 
you cannot determine the future by looking at the back of a U.S. currency. Now, I'm not down on people who find these things. They're interesting. I think we should be aware of them um, because we want to know what the enemy's doing and what the enemy's thinking. However, remember, only God can predict the future. And we should not be forming our theology and our understanding about end times through Antichrist messages. We have the Word of God that gives us all the information that we need about this time that we're that we're in. Now again, I'm not saying be ignorant to the fact that the enemy puts out those messages using these things. I'm not saying, you know, I'm just saying don't form your theology and your understanding of end time prophecy based on what the enemy is saying. Spend your time looking at what God is saying because he's the one speaking directly to you and he has provided and preserved his message in his word and in the testimony of believers over the generations. Now today we're going to be talking about the King James Bible, as I'm sure you've already gathered. And of course those of you who follow me on Facebook have already been sharing information with you. And uh, so we're going to be talking about that, talking about the King James Bible, and why I believe that that's the version believers should be leaning on primarily. Now as of late, um, really for a few months, several months, I've been having this nagging in my spirit. Get back to using the King James Version. I kept feeling that. And I would blow it off. And convince myself that, ah, you know, I'm just, that's just my mind. And, you know, and I've been ignoring this because I've been studying Hebrew heavily in the year of 2016. And as a result, I've been using the Hallelujah Scriptures primarily. Half of the scripture reading and commentary studies that I've done on the YouTube channel were done using the Hallelujah Scriptures. And by the way, I'm not down on the Hallelujah Scriptures at all. Uh, I'm just telling you what's been going on. So I started praying about this, and I believe that I definitely got confirmation from God that he was indeed putting this on my heart, and that it was a leading from him, which started me down a road of study. So I'm thinking, okay... If God wants me to use the New King or, or wants me to use the King James Version to do my studies and to do my teachings, then I need to know why. And really, this should be our attitude about anything. We need to know why we believe what we believe. So it started me down this road of study, and I'm going to share a small amount of the findings with you because it would take several hours and several podcasts to, to go through the whole thing. Uh, I should also point out that there is an article up at truthfed.com that includes three videos now, um, and then this podcast will be in there. And it's titled, Why I Use the King James Version. I may change the title a little bit, but you'll see it up there. And so there's a video from Kent Hovine, there's a video from Chuck Missler, and an hour and a half video from a guy I've, I've never heard of him before. I don't remember what his name is, but I watched the whole thing, and he did a wonderful demonstration. And so I highly recommend that if you're opposed to what I'm teaching right now, that you at least take three or four hours of your time, because that's, you know, I took that time, and check out those videos and check out the information, fact check the people. And what I think you'll find, you know, these videos provide a lot of information, a lot. And uh, I think you'll be on the same page as me if you take the time to study information. Uh, if you don't take the time to study the information, then I don't see how you have the right to form an opinion. Uh, and I'm going to share what uh, some of these findings with you uh, on this podcast today. Now, I want to start by saying I only recommend two versions of the Bible. Only two. Maybe a third, but I'm not ready to fully endorse the third yet. First and foremost, I believe that the King James Bible is the most reliable and pure version of God's Word in the English language. That's in my humble opinion. If you disagree with that, that's fine. Feel free to create your own podcast and talk about it on there. I believe God has preserved His Word, as He has promised, in the most common and dominant tongue, the English, and in the King James Version, just like He did in the Greek, when the Greek language was the common tongue. Now, if you're studying Hebrew and you're trying to learn the language, then I also recommend a copy of the Hallelujah Scriptures, which will come as no surprise to anyone, because we've spent a lot of time reading out of it, teaching out of it. It'll definitely help you in amazing ways with biblical Hebrew vocabulary and Hebrew understanding. 
Um, there's also a version, uh, you can see it on the Bible app, called the Scriptures 1998, I believe, uh, that's very, very similar to the Hebrew, uh, to the Hallelujah Scriptures. But when we're talking about studying the Scriptures and doing memory, verse memorization, studying the Scriptures, teaching the Scriptures, and verse, and verse memorization, I, I recommend none other than the King James Bible. Here's the third one that I'm not ready to fully embrace, but that I think may be okay. I'm still doing my studies on it, and there's a lot of good and bad that I'm finding so far. If you're brand new to the faith, you're a baby Christian, what a lot of people do is they run to the NIV. Do not do that. If you're struggling with the Old English a little bit that's found in the King James Version, then I, then I think you could use the New King James Version, but use it alongside the standard King James Version. You can actually do this for free by just going to Bible.com. There's a parallel option. You choose the King James Version and choose the New King James Version and use them in parallel to one another. You know, I do that kind of stuff all the time. helps get a greater understanding. It's a great way to study the Scriptures. Uh, you can also use a free piece of software called eSword, and I'm going to create some videos in the future eSword tutorials showing you how to study, how to do notes, how to journal, all that stuff using eSword. It's free. I just need to take the time to teach you. Uh, you know, it's a free program if you have a Windows computer. And let me know uh, on the website at truthfed.com, either in the forums or in the co actually comment section on this podcast at truthfed.com. Let me know if you're interested in an eSword tutorial, how to download different versions of the Bible how to use it to do your studies, how to journal, how to take notes. Let me know. And what's cool about that is you can look at the Strong's. So you can look at the meanings and the original words with a definition. And when I say original words, I simply mean whatever the word was that was there that they translated from when they used the manuscripts, which the King James Version relied on uh, the Hebrew text for the Old Testament and the Texas Receptus as the heaviest. Now with all that said... Those of you who are using the NIV, and I'm getting ready to show you why. The non-inspired version, as I call it. Move away from it. It's got a laundry list of problems that I will discuss with you here in just a minute. And honestly, nearly all modern translations will have the same problems, or some of these problems, or similar problems. First, got to talk about a little bit of history. The King James Version, which was also known as the Authorized version. King James did not name the Bible after himself, as some people claim. He simply funded the pot project. It actually didn't start being called the King James Bible until after he died. Uh, it's an English translation of the Christian Bible from the Church of England that began in 1604. So they started the project in 1604. They completed it in 1611. The books of the New King James Version included 39 books of the Old Testament that you have today. Uh, an intertestamental section containing 14 books of the Apocrypha, which most people don't realize, and 27 books of the New Testament, which are also in there today. I must point out that one thing that's always frustrated me and really kind of kept me from being one of those shout from the rooftops the King James Version is that usually the people who do that completely reject the Apocrypha which ironically was included in the original 1611 King James Version. I find that very frustrating. Moving on. The King James Version was put together based on 5,556 manuscripts that were available. That's leaps and bounds larger than any other uh, uh, manuscripts that are used for any other translations today. It had a major reliance on what is called the Texas Receptus. Now, you have to do your own research on some of this stuff because I don't have time to teach all of it. This was done in 1607 with more than 50 scholars, and they had prayer committees. So I want you to think about this. 50 scholars who were praying and having prayer committees who were committed to the reliance of God's Word, who if they misspelled or made one mistake on a page, they wouldn't just take that section out. They would throw the whole page away. They had 5,556 manuscripts at their disposal. Um, 
So through period, and, and in common with most other translations of the period, the New Testament was translated from Greek. That's why when you go to Strong's and Esword, when you're looking at the New Testament, you get Greek words instead of Hebrew. The Old Testament was translated from Hebrew and Aramaic, and the Apocrypha was translated from Greek and Latin. Let me say that I don't call I don't qualify the Apocrypha as God breathed scripture. I look at it as historical information that confirms the Bible. Um, it's kind of like this, you know, the Bible says, isn't it written in the books of the Kings or whatever? And, you know, several times it does certain things like that. The Bible's not saying that it's, that the book of the Kings, which was just a record, was scripture or God breathed. It was just saying it was reliable for historical information. I feel that way about the book of Yasher, the book of Jasher twice or three times. I think the Bible says, isn't it written in the book of Jasher? It's just saying, here's a source for this information that's reliable, is the way I view the Apocrypha and those books. I don't see them as scripture. I see them as just historical evidence that we can look at that confirms this, what the Bible is saying is true. So it seems that God is always preserving his word. In whatever dominant tongue of this age during the Roman Empire, you had the Greek and everything that was translated into Greek. You had the Septuagint of an, as an example. Uh, of course, uh, the disciples' letters were translated into Greek. He fast forward today, or really the 1600s, and the word is primarily and dominantly preserved in the English. And I believe that the King James Version is that version. Please note that it would take a week's worth of podcasts, like I said, to really get all this information to you. So go watch those videos that I that I have on the website. It's all, you know, Chuck Missler does an awesome job of breaking down how we got the Bible and why the King James is the most reliable. And then there's the two other videos on that page that are equally as valuable. That'll be a page worth bookmarking because I'm going to continue. It's going to be what I would call a living page at truthfed.com because I'm going to continue um, my research and updating that page. Now, Let's get to the meat of why the NIV specifically and almost every other modern translation is the same. Why you shouldn't be using this. Now, the NIV was based on a work of a couple of guys named Westcott and Hort. You need to study these guys and prepare to be appalled by what you find. Now, there's some important facts. I'm just going to give you a handful. But if you do a study on these guys, like I said, you'll be appalled by what you find out. Um, because it's important to know who's translating your Bible, right? Or should I say, who are the people who translated and created the manuscripts that are used for your Bible? And almost every modern translation today uses the same manuscripts that were translated by Westcott and Hort. Here's some bullet points to remember. Number one. Both were influenced by a, guy, by a guy named Origen and others who denied the deity of Christ. And you'll see this in the changes that are made in the text. This is crucial. Number one, right there, that's enough. I don't want to be reading any manuscripts, any translations that were translated by people who openly deny the deity of Jesus Christ. They relied on the Alexandria Gnostic Codex, which was basically translations by people who were more concerned with Greek philosophy. So they did not use the Texas Receptus. There's over 3,000... Listen, the codexes that they use, the Alexandrian Gnostic codexes, there's over 3,000 contradictions in the four Gospels alone. Alone. <laughs> That's a lot of contradictions, friends. And and they and look, these are only about 5% of the manuscripts found. Whereas the Texas Receptus, where they used over 5,000 manuscripts, agrees in 95% of all of them found. So you have the Texas Receptus, which is a 95% accuracy between all the manuscripts. Or you have the Alexandrian Gnostic Codex, where there's over 3,000 contradictions just in the Gospels, not counting everything else. Listen to this. They changed. They changed 
the traditional Greek text in over 8,413 places. That's, this is mind-boggling, the information that I've discovered. Uh, they were also atheist, closet atheist, I guess you could say. And it's been reported that they had a special club where they would dress up as women. I mean, we're talking about Westcott and Hort, the guys who created the Greek translations that most of your modern Bibles draw from today. They Listen, they, they claim to commune with the dead. They claim they commune with the dead, dead saints. So they would close themselves off in dark room and pray and, and conjure up the dead saints. My friends, I hope you're getting the point here. Hort is quoted as saying that there is no hell although he believed in some form of purgatory. Hort claimed that Jesus paying for our sins by his death is unscriptural. Did you catch that, folks? Do you want to read a translation by a guy who denies that Jesus Christ is God and also denies that he paid the, the price of your sins by his death? Also, Hort claimed that he loved Darwinism, loved Darwin's work. Folks, there's many quotes that you need to do your own research on. What I sh shared with you alone is enough for me to say I'm not touching anything done by these guys. Now, let's now, other than just you know doing lip service, let me. I've got so many scriptures written down, but I'm only going to take the time to give you a handful. So let's take a look at the things that they removed from the Bible, just by looking at the NIV compared with the King James Bible, and you're going to see their position on a lot of these things as we do this, their position about Christ, deity, and uh, about who he was. So let's start with this. And if you've got both Bibles, you can go to Bible.com. You know, just If you're at home, you're on a computer, just pause the podcast, go to Bible.com, and get the parallel up with the King James and the NIV. Um, we're going to start with Matthew 6, verse 13. Okay, so we'll go to Matthew chapter 6. Let's go to verse 13 here in the King James. And it says, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. For thine kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now let's look at 13 in the NIV. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. They leave out the whole part where it says for thy kingdom and power and glory forever that's pretty important and you might say well that's not too big of a deal um, okay let's go to Matthew 18 then so you go to Matthew chapter 18 and let's look at verse 11 in the King James it says for the son of man has come to save that which was lost that's pretty important right it's telling you why Jesus came, to save that which was lost. Let's look at uh, verse 11 in the NIV. Oh, wait. It's not there. Go ahead, look it up yourself. You'll see verse 10, and then verse 11's missing. And it goes on to verse 12. Why would they want you to not know that the Son of Man has come to save which was lost? Here's why. Because they believe, did not believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. And of course, they'll put the little footnotes in there and say, well, in the Alexandrian Codex, there, you know, that wasn't really there. Okay. Let's go to Matthew chapter 25. Again, I'm only going to show you a handful of these, but I've collected many. Matthew chapter 25, verse 13. King James says, Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Um, I'd say that's a pretty important, per, important part to that parable, wouldn't you? Watch therefore, for you know neither the day or the hour of what? That the Son of Man cometh. Now if you go to, to it in the NIV, it just says, Therefore keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. The day or the hour for what? You see, again, they didn't believe in the deity of Christ. 
and that there'd be a second coming. And so Jesus is saying, and when you read it in the King James, you need, you know, neither day or the hour when the son of man comes, but they leave that out in the NIV. It, it gets worse. Let's go to Mark chapter two, verse 17. This one I find to be pretty appalling. When Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, I'm reading the King James, they that are whole have no need of a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus is saying, look, People who are already in repentance, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not here for them. I'm here for those who are lost and to call them to repent, right? Part of the whole salvation process is repentance, right? Turning away from sin. Well, let's see what DNIV says. On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. You've come to call the, you've not come to call the righteous, but you've come to call the sinners to do what? So people read that in NIV. Oh, he just came to call me. No, he's coming. He, he, this is the problem. This is why you have uh, people who, you know, they, they don't care about sin. They're not concerned about the way they live. It's things like this throughout their Bibles. You see, they think, oh, Jesus just came to call me because I'm sick. No, he came to call you to do something, which is to repent, which is very clear in the King James Bible but missing in the NIV. Hope you guys are getting the point here. You want to do a couple of more? Let's do Mark 9. We're already at 30 minutes, but who cares? It's Thanksgiving. Mark 9, verse 44. Where there worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Okay, he's talk, let's, let's get some context here. He's saying that if you, he's talking about, this is the scripture where he's talking about if you cause one of these little ones to, to, let's just start with verse 42. And whoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for him to have that milestone hung around his neck and they were cast into the sea. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into the life maimed than having two hands and to go into hell into a fire that never be quenched. Where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Now remember, these guys didn't believe in hell. Jesus is saying, look, the fire never ends. That's what he's saying in verse 44. Oh, if you go to the NIV, again, that whole line is missing. Verse 44, not there. interesting. You see, when you know the history of these guys, then you understand why certain things are missing, right? Like things about hell, things about Jesus' deity, things about him coming again. Let's go to Mark 11. And on the surface, they look like not a big deal, but I'm telling you, as you dig into this, and I'm hoping that you're understanding where I'm getting at right now. Folks, any time that a translation just decides to leave verses out, that's a big deal to me. Mark 11. Verse 26. But if ye do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive you your trespasses. That's pretty important, right? Jesus is saying, if you don't forgive, your Father's not going to forgive you. Guess what? In the NIV, it's just not there. Verse 26. They just decided to remove verse 26. Oh, it wasn't in the Alexandrian. <laughs> that's a pretty serious thing to know, is it not? But if ye do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive you your trespasses. They decided that you didn't need to know that if you're reading a modern translation. I'm going to give you four more. And again, I'm just scratching the surface of what I've got written down here. Let's go to the book of Luke. Let's go to chapter 2. These guys really hated the deity of Christ because a lot of this is where it's found is in the New Testament. 
Luke chapter 2, let's go to verse 33. And Joseph, th- see this is, one, these, this is one of those where if you're not paying attention, you won't catch it. Verse 33, and Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him, talking about Jesus. Now if you look at 33, remember, they denied the deity of Christ. If you look at it in the NIV, it says the child's father and mother marveled. Wait a minute. Jesus' father is God, Elohim, Yahweh. See how the King James says, and Joseph and his mother? Notice how they didn't call Joseph his father. Joseph and his mother. But the NIV says, and the child's father. Again, it's just conspicuously taking away the deity of Christ by changing the name Joseph to his father to make it seem like this earthly man was his father. And we know that's not true. And you wouldn't catch that normally, you know what I mean? See, this is the problem. It's, you know, and I've, it's, it's, you know, rat poison is 99% good food. It's only 1% poison. And see, that's what they do with these translations. And you can hardly you can hardly find the poison unless you know it's there. Luke chapter four verse four and Jesus answered him saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but every word of God. And of course the NIV just says, Man shall not live by bread alone, taking out completely that you will live what you'll actually live on, which is by the word of God. We have translations made by people who do not even respect the word. Two more, and then we'll wrap it up. John, chapter 3, verse 15. That whoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. NIV says that any everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. They took out the perish part. Why? Because they don't believe in hell. So they're saying, oh, if you believe in Jesus, you'll and they they remove the part that you will that if you don't, you will perish. It's a pretty important part, wouldn't you say? And then uh, we'll do one out of Revelation. And I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven more that I could do, but for the sake of time, I will not. So let's go to Revelation chapter 11, verse 17. King James says, saying we give, let me make sure I'm on the right one. Yep. Saying we give thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken To thee thy great power and hast reigned. Now, would you say that it's important to know that in in this verse it says that God was and is and is to come, right? The is to come part's pretty important, right? Because that's our blessed hope. You know, we're waiting on his return to set up the kingdom. Well, these guys didn't believe that. So if you go to the NIV, they say, We give thanks to you, Lord of God Almighty, the one who is and who was. Because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. They left out the part about that he's going to come again. Because they deny the deity. We could do this all morning long, friends. I must note that I checked these scriptures alongside the New King James Version and I did not find this problem to exist there. Uh, Which is why I said the New King James may be an okay alternative, at least temporarily, Um, but the King James is the version. Also, I want you to know that, have you noticed that the King James version is the only one that's not like copyrighted or patent, meaning that, uh, and I'm not using the right terminology, but it's basically free source to use, to quote. Um, But did you know that in order to publish a new version of the Bible, you have to change enough things to make it different enough so that you can put a copyright on it and patent it and make a profit. There's a lot that has to be changed to be able to do that. Now, there's over 200 versions today like this. 
Think about all those versions that are available for use today and how much they've had to change the text in order to patent them and copyright them. They're not legit. Again, I recommend two Bibles. King James. That's the, that's the go-to. And I even have a King James Names of God version. For those of you who want Yeshua put back in there, who want Yahweh put back in there, and some other names, some other titles like El and Elohim and, and things like that. And I've got a short link for you to find that. It's on Amazon. Go to truthfed.com slash KJV. Truthfed.com slash KJV will take you to that one that I'm using. If you want the Apocrypha, go to truthfed.com slash extra. That'll give you the Apocrypha, and it also includes Jubilees, Jasher, and Enoch. Truthfed.com slash extra for that, or truthfed.com slash KGV for the King James Bible. And then again, if you're, if you're in the process of learning Hebrew and studying Hebrew, then you really should have a copy of the Hallelujah Scriptures. It'll make a massive difference. So here's my conclusion. Like I said, I've spent the last year, nearly, diligently studying Hebrew. I've looked at many translations. I've spent hours researching this information. I've prayed and received confirmation about this. So I didn't come at this lightly, friends. And I recommend that you do the same before you come to an opinion. Pray. Research. But my conclusion is this, and you can agree or disagree, but my conclusion is that the Word of God has been preserved in the King James Version. And that most other translations in English are nothing short of apostate. Which is probably a large reason for the church itself going apostate. People are hearing wrong versions, wrong translations. When they're sitting in those church buildings, the pastors are teaching the wrong thing. It doesn't take much to change and change the whole context of something. And I realize that this will be potentially an unpopular podcast. And, uh, but I'm not interested in being popular. As a matter of fact, I'm even going to disable the comments for this podcast because I don't want the trolls coming in and leading people astray. Those of you who are true followers and supporters of this work, you know how to contact me. You know how to have these conversations. You can do it at the website at truthfed.com. Feel free to come to the comments section and have your conversations there. Truthfed.com. Just go to the blog post. Share your thoughts there. You know, we, and, uh, and so anyway, that's, that's my spew on the King James Bible and why I recommend it and why moving forward I'm going to be primarily teaching out of it. I'm not going to stop teaching Hebrew things and all of that for those of you who love that. I'm just saying for verse memorization, study, and teaching, I'm using the King James. And this is because I've been feeling this leading in my spirit, which led me down this whole rabbit hole. And I've sucked, and I've seeked God in praying and all of this. So, again, I didn't come at it lightly. Uh, also, in closing, we must remember to remain steadfast in prayer. Okay? Darkness has not fled away. It's not going to go away. Troubling times are still headed our way. You know, now it's possible. I don't know for sure, but a lot of people seem to think that it's possible we might see a small window of grace or a small reprieve, but that does not mean it's going to come easy. It'll be against great adversity. So please continue to pray. Pray for righteousness in the land. Pray that Trump actually gets to take office and that God will intervene and hinder the wicked plans of the enemy. Make no mistakes, my friend. The enemy has not gone away. The enemy has some very sinister plans for us and our nation over the next few weeks. You can bet on it. So let's continue to pray and repent. And let us also remember this fact. You know, right now people are scared about the Electoral College and that it's, they're going to try to pull, pull fast when maybe they will. I don't know. Uh, my thought on that is this. If Trump being president-elect is of God like all these people claim, if it really is of God, then nothing anyone does will be able to stop it because they will be fighting against God, right? I'm personally not sold on the whole America is, is saved movement that's been moving through Christianity. I say things will continue to spiral. The beast will continue to be formed uh, because there's too many end time signs that are upon us and we know the end is near. And we know that our redemption draws nigh, but we must not fall asleep, friends. 
you must stay steadfast in prayer. You're in a war. You can't just step away. That's all I got for you. Please consider supporting the mission of truth and spreading the good news and declaring the return and the return of our king and the time of the tribulation, which is what I do. Uh, you can do that by going to truthfed.com and there's a support tab at the top. Have a blessed Thanksgiving and God willing, I'll speak to you next week. Peace and grace. Until next time.